Hello. Oh, crikey. Feels like I should be toasting the bridesmaids up here. I think it's... Um, yes, so as Graham said, I'm Dr. Jacob Habgood. I'm allowed to use that term now. Um, I'm head of serious games at Sumo Digital. Um, I'm talking to you today about uh, a new game that we're developing for WiiWare. But um, first thing, I'm going to give you a bit of background on, on us and, and what we're about. So, Sumo Digital are a, a work for hire console developer. Um, we work with big companies like Sega, Konami, Sony, on across the sort of range of, uh, of console platforms. Um, we've got around about 120 developers now in Sheffield. And we, many of those developers, go back to the uh, bygone days of, uh, of Gremlin Graphics in, uh, in Sheffield for people that remember those days. Uh, these days, we're part of a, a bigger kind of conglomeration of game developers, uh, uh, largely in America. Um, and it's around about sort of 900, 1,000 people worldwide in this group. And as a group of developers, we probably develop a lot of the games that um, you're familiar with, but we, we're generally the, the people who develop for the publisher. So they come to us with a, a piece of IP like Sega Superstars Tennis, and we make them a tennis game. And, you know, we've worked on you know, Outrun, Virtua Tennis, Track and Field, big titles for big names. But you may not necessarily heard of Sumo because we're, we're sort of developing for the, the publisher themselves. Now, my background is with Gremlin. Um, I, as uh, Graham was saying, used to work on uh, PlayStation games back in the day. Uh, from a technical background, I, I was a PlayStation programmer. I, I was a, a, a lead programmer as well on various projects. But I decided um, in about two, 2003 that I should um, go back to university and look at this whole idea of games and learning. And I mean, for me, back then, it, it didn't seem like a, a particularly uh, sexy thing to do. I mean, these days there are big conferences and everything. But back then, uh, most of my friends thought me, I was pretty, uh, pretty insane to do that. Um, but I met some nice people at the University of Nottingham, and um, uh, they gave me a scholarship to to study the effective integration of digital games and learning content. And I talked a little bit about my PhD yesterday, for those of you that uh, were able to attend the session. Um, I'll, I'll briefly cover some parts of it today, but if you want to find more information about that, there's a website there, zombiedivision.co.uk, that you can visit. Now, in my role as head of serious games at Sumo Digital, um, most of the work that we've done so far has been linked to hobbyist game development. So, um, while I was doing my PhD, I was fortunate enough to co-author a book with Mark Overmars, the creator of Game Maker, um, which became quite successful and is being used in schools around the country. Um, and so we've done a, a fair bit of work with uh, different publishers, helping them develop uh, their own game development tools for kids. But as, as yet, we've not developed any specific learning products, learning that ha products that have educational goals yet. So, uh, traditionally, um, or these days, um, there's, there are starting to come console products, uh, are starting to come, uh, sorry, these days edutainment products are starting to come to console platforms. And uh, these tend to be developed by smaller developers, perhaps to make ends meet whilst chasing the big publishing deal, and uh, not necessarily companies which have an expertise or passion for learning. At Sumo, we're a large developer. Um, we have a great tracker record with uh, console game development, and large publishers really do beat a path to our door. They want to work with us. Um, but we also have a passion and expertise for game-based learning, my own background uh, as a PhD in cognitive science, but also, I mean, many of my colleagues have children these days and, and we're really interested in creating products which can uh, improve them as well. So we're perfectly positioned to branch into learning-based console products. And in order to kind of uh, show that, we've, we've decided to create a showcase game that illustrates, I think, perhaps the way that the games industry might try and approach creating uh, learning games. So we're creating a fairly modest game. Uh, it's a self-funded title um, for WiiWare, which for those of you that don't know it, it's uh, downloadable content on your Wii. You go online, you can put in your credit card details, buy points, download games, um, called Outnumbered. Um, and I'm going to talk uh, at some length about the design of that game uh, today. So really, the philosophy behind this is very much 
anti-edutainment. Um, when I went back to university, that, that was really what I was interested in. Um, why edutainment seemed to have failed to harness the, the essence of, of the intrinsic motivation, the, 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 uh, the fun of games, um, and also, you know, often failed to sort of include good pedagogy as well. And, I mean, this is often summed up as a, a chocolate-covered broccoli approach to integrating games and learning content. And, you know, there's been a lot of research that shows that this kind of approach doesn't really work. You know, the chocolate is the game, the broccoli is the learning content, we smear one in the other, and the children chew off all the chocolate and throw the broccoli away. Um, and, uh, you know, a good illustration of that, um, I think I saw recently, um, and I, I don't normally like to single people out, um, but these people make fantastic um, uh, adventure games. I don't know if you've seen them. Uh, Amantia Design, and uh, they, they've won awards for their adventure games that they've made. Point and click adventures, very immersive, very beautiful graphics and everything. But they did a game which tried to integrate learning content in it as well, and they did it in a very traditional, uh, extrinsic approach. They had a bunch of questions which you answered um, at various points in the game, and then you carried on with the game. There was no real link between the learning content and the game. It was simply chocolate-covered broccoli. And I was interested when I went back to do my PhD in whether more integrated approaches from this could be more effective for learning. And we did a, a range of studies based on a game called Zombie Division, a game which I built during my PhD in which you, you fought skeletons um, and divided them by using different weapons that you had. Um, and in order to do this, we did proper psychological, uh, randomly controlled experimental trials using uh, um, a comparison between an integrated approach uh, in which skeletons had numbers on their chests and you divided those skeletons using uh, different attacks um, and an extrinsic approach where those skeletons had symbols. So you can see on the left, left hand side we've got the extrinsic approach where the skeletons have got the symbols. On the right hand side we've got the, um, the numbers. But also in the extrinsic version at the end of each level you would be given uh, question and answer. You would be given exactly the same mathematical problems, but in a Q&A sort of based approach. We then also had a control version which had no learning in it at all. And we did a range of studies, uh, and we found, uh, to cut a long story short, uh, that intrinsic games are more motivating than extrinsic games, as measured by the amount of time children would spend playing them. We also discovered that intrinsic games were more effective than extrinsic games, as measured by the learning games that were observed pre, post, delay test. So we did some quite thorough research into this. And as I said, have a look at my website if, uh, if you want more information on that. So we were really keen to kind of feed this research into the design of, of this game that we're making. And so it would be a maths-based game for WeWeb. And the most important thing would be that it would be intrinsically integrated. So it would deliver the learning content alongside and in tandem with the flow experience of the game. But also it would integrate the uh, learning content within the structure of the gaming world and the core mechanics of that gaming world. And we'll come back to core mechanics in a bit. But hopefully by explaining the game design to you, you'll understand more about what I'm talking about here. But also, I mean, there's some more general things. We, we, we wanted to be un unpatronizing and unapologetic in our design approach. Kids are generally quite aspirational. We didn't want to produce something that was kind of very, looked very kiddie. So we designed sort of for big kids, ourselves essentially. And safe is dull, zombies, monsters, explosions are great fun. Uh, and I think another point, I, I, I always um, get frustrated when I hear about games that make, make learning fun, make maths fun. I mean, to me, something like maths is a medium. It's neither fun nor boring. It's simply something you can work with. I mean, you wouldn't talk about a football game making grass fun. Um, so all games are about learning something. And the fact that in our game this happens to be mathematics should be almost entirely irrelevant to the player. It's just a medium to work with. So the pedagogy behind this um, is based on a, a range of research in mathematics as, as well as our own. Um, and it, it's about connections in mathematics. So we wanted to cover learning content that's very traditional, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Um, and yes, we wanted to get children to practice um, in, in this area, but 
Um, we felt that you know, conceptual and procedural knowledge, so knowledge about concepts and knowledge about sort of more sort of practice-based uh, learning in mathematics needed to be developed alongside each other. And we wanted to go beyond rote learning. So we wanted to embody meaningful relationships between knowledge, um, which is essential for understanding. It's, it's not about addition or subtraction or multiplication and division as separate things. It's about how those things come together, about the relationships between them. And I think if you say look at a game like brain training, uh, or sorry, or even uh, math training, uh, you know, it's teaching you how to do some of those things separately, but it's not necessarily making a connection between the different learning content. And the whole idea of anchored instruction, I mean, I think this, uh, this is very relevant to um, Derek's work, actually. I, I think uh, th th there was some work done um, by Bransford and the University of Vanderbilt um, some years ago now, looking at using... Uh, films as a, as a real-world anchor for learning and you show kids films and they would then they would build all sorts of activities around those films that were educational I think that's very close to what uh, Derek and his, his fantastic teachers are doing um, but also to some extent that's what we're trying to do with something like this so we are building a world in which mathematics is relevant um, to, to a fantasy, not a real world situation, but nonetheless to the kids, that's as real as, you know, they are certainly in, still interested in that, uh, that world. So the basic concept, a uh, bit of spiel here, um, maths can be fatal, especially if you're a monster. Attach your brain to your wand arm and get ready to cause some serious mayhem as you defend your wizard's home against an army of magical beasts. So, um, outnumbered, uh, this is the kind of screen layout that you're presented with. As I said, you know, it's a WiiWare title. These things retail for kind of less than a tenner, sometimes only £3.50. You download them direct to your console. There's no box or anything. The budget that we've kind of got to put into this is not massive. Uh, so we've, we've gone for a 2D game. Rather than the zombie division, uh, which would have been a, a kind of 3D environment, that was too expensive to look at. So we've looked at a, a 2D alternative here. But in doing so, we've also been able to get some extra features in. So I think uh, it, it, it's worked out quite well. So I'm going to talk about the core mechanics. Because so far, I've, I've talked about you know, integrating mathematics into a gameplay. But I really want to illustrate how we're trying to do that. Um, and I can't really do that without explaining some of how the game is designed. And for those that haven't really had too much contact with the uh, games industry, this idea of core mechanics may not be particularly familiar to you. Um, and there's a definition here, mechanism through which players make meaningful choices and arrive at a meaningful play experience. I mean, you can kind of summarize core mechanics as the rules of the game, but it's a, it's a bit deeper than that. Um, so there are four main mechanics that we use in the game. They create the, the basis for the mathematical play in the game, and then we try and mix up uh, the mathematics so that you get all sorts of different relationships between those basic mechanics. So the first game mechanic is playing with goo. Um, the game is based around magical mana. Um, this comes in two flavors. Monsters, which you've seen on the previous side, um, are made of bad mana, while the wizard's tower, your home, uh, attracts good mana to it. So you get little clouds around your, um, your dwelling, um, which have hanging from it this, these gloops of, go of good mana. And bad mana can be neutralized with good mana. So monsters die when you reduce their bad mana exactly now to zero, and you just simply fling it at them. It sticks to them, and once their mana is reduced to zero, they die. However, if you overshoot, that all that mana falls off and you start again. So you've, you've got to think about where you're aiming for, about the numbers that you're subtracting, and about how you reduce that exactly down to zero. The second core mechanic, monster grow bags. So you can create your own good monsters. You can drop man mana onto a monster grow bag, and it will form its own good cloud. You can fill it up to the desired value by repeatedly adding mana, and then you can drag your own monster out of this grow bag and place it onto the landscape. It will wander off down the landscape towards the enemy monsters and uh, defeat any bad monster in its value with an equal value and take out any enemies behind it as well. So at the beginning of the game, throwing goo is subtraction. Growing monsters is addition. And mixing up the color of goo is absolutely fine. However, at some point in the game, you're introduced to monsters which are pure evil. 
Monsters which are pure evil can only be defeated by pure good mana, i.e. you can only use a single color of goo against them. So now we've changed the mechanic and throwing goo actually becomes division by repeated subtraction because you have to keep using the same value until you've reduced it down to zero. Growing monsters becomes multiplication by repeated addition because you have to keep adding the same value to build up your um, monster. Then, as things progress, we start to bring magic into play. It wouldn't be a wizard-based game without a bit of magic. And ultimately, repeated subtraction is, is a very slow way to divide a monster. So you can use magic to speed that up, and any value of blob can be powered up to be a divisor. And those divisors, if they will divide the number uh, uh, exactly uh, into a whole part, then it will kill that monster. And you have a range of different blobs of different colors that represent different kinds of attacks. You have a fire-based attack, an ice-based attack, and a lightning-based attack. And there are mathematical relationships between these attacks as well. So all of the uh, divisors which are divisible by two are red. Um, the ones that are divisible by two, three have a blue tint. The ones that are divisible by five have a, a yellow tint. And as they combine, they have a mathematical relationship within that. So obviously, eight is the same as dividing by um, two three times, so it has the same color as, as two. Six is the same as dividing by three, then dividing by two, so it's, it's a combination of blue and red. And then you have a similar mechanic with uh, multiplying monsters, which allows you to speed that up as well. So you'll be to use magic to, to grow your monsters into a larger size. These are then the basic mechanics. You're throwing goo, you're repeated subtraction, you're growing monsters, you're repeated addition, dividing monsters with magic becomes division, multiplying mana becomes multiplication. And you then just start to mix these up to make emergent gameplay, to, to change the rules so that the player has to adapt and think about the kind of mathematics that you're using. So we already have the pure evil, pure good thing, but we can start to introduce monster immunity. So some monsters can be immune to uh, red mana, some monsters can be immune to blue mana or yellow mana. And then you've got to think about a different divisor that can be used to divide that monster. You can also use a blob of mana to reduce the value down by a bit and then use a different one to divide it. So you could take a prime number like 23, subtract two from it and then divide it by three. You can have smart bombs that kill all monsters on a level, which are divisible by a number. You can have end of level bosses that have multiple heads and, and different mana values for each body part. So you can start to build up um, a, a real a sort of mathematical playground, if you like, within the game mechanics of the game. On top of this, then, um, we, we are controlling the different dif difficulty levels. So, the standard gameplay progression it would look at changing the speed, the quantity, the strength, and the look of the monsters that you meet in the game, and that will be the same for every player as they go through the game. However, the mathematical difficulty of the game will be based on a co cognitive model. So, it tracks the use of key domain concepts in this area, and during my PhD, I was able to kind of map out this area of mathematics in terms of the concepts involved, and it varies the difficulty in according to uh, how how many concepts you've graphed. So, for example, dividing by two is very simple once you realize that all even numbers divide by two. Um, but until you've done that, it may be more difficult to do so. So, this allows there to be a different experience mathematically for every player as they play the game. And if you're a professor of mathematics, you're going to get a very difficult game to play with from the start, whereas if you're just a seven-year-old, it's going to keep it at your level. It also adds additional repay value to the game um, that um, should make it uh, uh, more fun. So, um, I'm going to give you a demo of the, the Wii version of the game so far. It's, it's probably around about 50% complete. Um, and uh, we'll see how that goes. I have my uh, Wii Switch. <laughs> So as I do this, I, I'm not actually facing the screen, so I have my Wii sensor bar at some kind of strange angle, which makes it quite difficult to control. Uh, we'll uh, see how well I do. So this is our mana. It's kind of globular. We can throw it around and play with it a bit. Um, and then as our, we go in a straight line, we can start to hit monsters with it like this. I can mix up my mana uh, 
but I can reduce this one. Down to zero. And then he dies. And I get a bit of a reward, and between levels, I'll be to spend my money on advancements and, and upgrades for my level. So. Now, if we keep throwing mana at our monsters until it, uh, we exceed the value, it all falls off and starts again. So we have to go back to scratch and we have to divide that, uh, we have to reduce that exactly down to zero. Now, when it comes to using magic, obviously magic's a lot quicker. We can simply turn a, uh, a blob into a fireball, and we can blow one up like that. And you can use a range of different uh, tokens for that. from the air, from the land, from the sea, and in the final game there'll be a range of different monsters that you, uh, that you meet, that change as you go along, and a level bosses, that kind of stuff, so. If we just let them carry on. So, uh, this is a game that will be coming to WiiWare in the summer of 2009. It's going to be a very cheap title, it's sort of somewhere between 500 to 1,000 Wii points. It might cost you anything from sort of £3.50 upwards. But we hope that it will sort of act as an example of, of good game design and, and a good application of learning within a, a game-based product. Thank you very much. Well, there's a proof that a uh, complex idea can be delivered quite simply. Question from the audience. Over here. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm obviously not very good at these things. Uh, Dave McCall from Sons Online again. Um, sorry, Jacob, I'm going to challenge you rather because you used a, a phrase that, that uh, was very much directed at the kind of thing that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't mean to, I appreciate. But you said, um, do not try to make maths fun. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid I started sort of adrenalizing round about that point. Um, here's the challenge to you. We're one of those garage outfits that people say can't exist because you need big money uh, to produce this stuff. But we have uh, something like 100 games now that cover the complete curriculum, primary, secondary, special needs. Mm -hmm. uh, that includes things like trigonometry and, um, you know, the, the hard stuff, not just the tables at the bottom. Everywhere we put it in, and we're very successful, we sell tens of thousands of pounds of this into schools now, onto PSPs, and onto Windows mobile devices, and onto Nokia phones, and we're doing that in something like 60 LEAs. Uh, we get reports back, in all the official reports, the kids love maths. Mm -hmm. And our stuff is based around maths, and I'll yeah. tell you something about our maths. Um, I can explain how to do our complete curriculum games in a fifth of the time you took to explain throwing goo at a monster. Mm -hmm. Because our stuff's intuitive and it's to do with stuff that kids understand, like hanging monkeys on number line. It's not 3D. Uh -huh. um, it doesn't have any sort of complicated philosophy behind it. It's stuff that people like me have been developing in schools for years. And it strikes me that what's going on here, and I've watched a lot of presentations today, is that the games industry thinks it is uh, pretty clever and it can now invent learning. Well, we've been doing learning for quite a few years. Come and speak to some of us. Um, there's a whole industry of people who've been producing stuff for schools very successfully uh, and for very small money, and we actually understand how to make kids enjoy stuff. Um, what we need is your skills to blend some of those things to make, if you like, a lot more excitement going on in the platforms in the way that Derek was talking about. But what we're not doing is reinventing the wheel from scratch. So there's your challenge. You've got a game for Wii. Our stuff runs on Wii. Um, you can get it for very small amounts of money. And it will cover 100 times as much as you've got. So, and sounds kids like more of a comment trained. than a question. Yeah, but, uh, yeah sorry, <laughs> it is a comment, yeah, but I think it was hoping to provoke a response. It's, I think it's good to get a comment, so maybe a response yeah, to the... To yeah, the, I think there are a whole range of things there. I mean, the whole making maths fun, I think that's a different issue. I'm not saying that kids can't enjoy maths. That I'm just saying that maths is a medium for you to work with. Um, but, I mean... It, 
in terms of what we're trying to do and, and explaining my concept there. I mean, explaining a game design can be quite a complicated thing, and I was conscious when I was writing this that that's the way it could come across. But actually playing a game is extremely simple. I mean, if you were to write down, for example, and you know, I get to look at game designs for all sorts of video games uh, that are quite com complex, but kids have absolutely no problem playing them at the end of the day. I mean, if you were to write down the game design for Zelda, it's incredibly complex. There, there are huge things that they have to learn. There are huge processes that they have to go through. But yet they have no problem at all grasping it. So please don't confuse presenting something. And, I, you know, I think when you're presenting something, I'm trying to give a certain amount of rigor to what I do. Um, so, you know, that's why I'm trying to go in much detail. Just that doesn't mean that it, it, it's not valuable simply because I can't. Um, get across the concept in, in, you know, in two lines because it's more complicated than something that's come out before. So that's mine. Last question at the back, please. Hello. David Jaffa from Sam Learning. Hopefully less challenging question than the last one. Um, in terms of monsters, zombies and blowing things up, mm -hmm. what's your experience of gender differences and, and how girls respond to that as opposed to boys? I mean, with Zombie Division, when we were in schools, we actually found that, uh, I mean, one of our studies, we had a statistically significant result which showed that girls played the game longer than boys, which was not what we expected. Um, I, I mean, we found that girls quite, would quite happily engage with this kind of product within a school environment. Now, I don't necessarily think that means that they would go home and purchase these products. Um, they might see them more as boy uh, or male-oriented projects. Um, but at the same time, I also feel that in some ways, uh, boys are the ones that are falling behind, if you like. It's, it's the boys that perhaps have the, the problem at the back of the classroom uh, concentrating on their mathematics lessons. And so something like this that does appeal uh, to a male-based audience, I, I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. Thank you. Thank you.